Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to, uh, to be here and uh, uh, really uh, fascinating. Uh, I've always loved these interdisciplinary symposia because you always learn so much. Um, so we've been focused, as Philippe was mentioning, on the uh, interaction between uh, T lymphocytes and antigen presenting cells. So these um, interactions, it was, as we've already kind of uh, as we've been alluded to, uh, are important for control of a number of uh, uh, you know, viral, bacterial, uh, helminth infections, uh, and particularly uh, in the context of uh, there can be you know, cytotoxicity associated with some T cell subsets, but you know things like interferon gamma are produced in large amounts by uh, uh, by, by uh, certain types of uh, helper T cells, and those are the the cell types I'll be mostly uh, focusing on for this talk. Although uh, many of the things I'll be saying are pretty much general for um, also apply to CD8 uh, positive T cells that are involved in cytotoxicity. Uh, so the basic uh, recognition process is driven by the T cell antigen receptor and uh, complexes of histocompatibility antigens uh, that are on uh, so-called antigen presenting cells, which uh, take in uh, or otherwise process protein antigens into peptides that are bound to the uh, histocompatibility antigens, basically peptide binding proteins, or quite polymorphic peptide binding proteins. Uh, there are maybe hundreds of thousands of copies of these uh, proteins on the surface. Uh, a small fraction of those would be loaded with relevant uh, peptides to make a ligand for a T cell receptor, which is unique to that uh, T cell. Uh, that T cell then undergoes this recognition process in parallel with adhesion molecules. And it's, it's very important to have these adhesion systems because Again, because of this competition between all the various peptides that the cell is picking up and all the proteins that it's degrading, they're competing for these binding processes. And, you know, in a physiological setting, you might be starting with around uh, 10 to 100 of these MHC peptide complexes. That's not enough to provide adhesive energy. The adhesion molecules help out with that process. And this uh, interface, which, uh, as I'll show you in a moment, why we, why we think this way, but you know, referred to as an immunological synapse, uh, drives a number of responses in the T cell that are important for uh, adaptive immunity. And uh, it's also important to keep in mind that while these cells protect us from many types of infections, they can also hurt us in the context of immunopathology driven by some infections and uh, uh, also autoimmunity uh, and of course, uh, you know, microbes in, in some ways probably have a lot to do with also with uh, uh, these, these uh, uh, errors that T cells sometimes make in the context of autoimmunity. So the antigen presenting cells also undergo a number of responses, and these are quite critical. Uh, once you have uh, these activated effector T cells, they'll go out into the tissues and interact with other antigen presenting cells, which uh, in slightly different contexts may be uh, the, you know, macrophages that will either come into contact or already have uh, microbes either phagocytosed or perhaps even in their cytoplasm. And the T cells using cytokines and other mechanisms can basically help these cells uh, come up with the right solutions to uh, clear those, to, to destroy those pathogens. Uh, this can also involve cytokine release to modify uh, tissue environments. Uh, and, you know, there are a number of phenomena. But one I'll be particularly, I guess, kind of linking into is... Uh, uh, a situation where the antigen presenting cell is a B cell, which is another part of the adaptive immune system, which makes antibodies, and these cells have these uh, antibody or surface immunoglobulin molecules on their surface, and the initially, that then particularly in these uh, germinal center reactions, that capture the intact antigens, process them to these MHC peptide complexes, and then uh, the more of these MHC peptide complexes these B cells present, the more uh, feedback they get, basically reinforcement they get from, the, from helper T cells to uh, improve those uh, antibodies. So there's a direct link between antigen uptake by high affinity receptors, making these MHC peptide complexes in increasing amounts, and getting more help from T cells. So in order to, uh, as Philip mentioned, in order to you know, study the signaling mechanisms and, and various other types of communication in this interface, we, uh, you know, kind of when I was even back in the 1980s as a student and in the 90s when we kind of set up these reconstitution systems more completely uh, have, have relied on uh, converting this antigen presenting cell into a uh, planar substrate. And this has a lot of advantages from an imaging standpoint. It also has a number of uh, you know, caveats, as you can imagine. But, uh, you know, certainly, we've, as I'll show you, I think we've been able to uh, learn quite a bit from this uh, 
uh, this model system, although we always want to refer back to either live antigen presenting cells or uh, even in vivo environments to basically uh, test uh, things that we believe we've learned from these uh, reductionist uh, models. So, so this is, I, I'm just kind of very schematically representing this as a single line, but basically it's a technology referred to as a supported lipid bilayer. Uh, it's a, uh, essentially a lipid bilayer, a phospholipid bilayer on a, a glass substrate, uh, and it's generated by, in our, in our case, usually by fusion of uh, liposomes, and this is a technology originally developed in Hardin McConnell's lab at Stanford, and used quite a bit to probe in, I guess when they first started using this was really for looking at some aspects of the biophysics of FC receptor triggering, uh, was then picked up by immunologists, other, you know, kind of uh, more widely in immunology in the mid-1980s to demonstrate, for the first demonstrations, that MHC, purified MHC peptide complexes would activate T cells, and that's when we learned about it uh, when I was in Tim Springer's lab, and we used it to reconstitute adhesion systems, and then uh, Ten years later, when I was at WashU, used it to basically reconstitute the immunological synapse using uh, the adhesion by combining the adhesion molecules and the MHC peptide complex, presenting these to the T cells. So these are the that's basically the substrate we use now. In terms of imaging, imaging technologies uh, that we can use with the system, uh, you know, one of the most basic ones we started with was wide field fluorescence, and this is you know really just the most simple conventional type of optics where you you know illuminate everything pretty much capture pretty much everything with one focal plane and then form an image with a camera. Uh, so in our case with the supported bilayer, a lot of our fluorescent signal was right in that uh, interface of these laterally mobile uh, fluorescently labeled uh, MHC peptide complexes in ICAM-1 and therefore our sample was kind of uh, planar and therefore very uh, accessible to this kind of imaging. We actually would get a very sharp single image plane of fluorescence even with this uh, very simple optical method. Uh, now, when we wanted to start looking at molecules that were actually in the cell, it became very important to restrict our, our focal plane, and it, we, it was kind of very serendipitous. Uh, there's this method called total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy that had been around since the 70s, really, but was a very optically inconvenient methodology. It involved large optical benches and steering lasers and very inconvenient sample preparation for a biologist. Uh, so it was, you know, it's something we were thinking about and dreaming about all through the 80s, but just the implementation seemed kind of too painful for us as, as biologists, so, uh, so we, we never did it. And then, um, fortunately, Olympus came up in the, around 2000, maybe late 90s, early, right, right, right when we, we moved to New York University at that point, we set up, bought some new microscopes and got one of these Olympic, Olympus microscopes that had a very high numerical aperture objective, and, and the trick in the total internal reflection illumination is that you need to steer the light path for your, your excitation of fluorescence at an uh, angle that exceeds what's referred to as the critical angle uh, for this interface. And the interface, you know, the glass uh, has one refractive index, the media and the cell has a lower refractive index, so that refractive index gradient defines a critical angle at which all the light will reflect in. And in order to do this, uh, you can either come in with a very fancy optical arrangement and basically bounce the laser around in the cover slip and try and get it to basically illuminate that interface. Uh, or with these through the objective systems, you could simply just set up a, what looks like a standard epifluorescence microscope, but with the very high numerical aperture of the objective, with greater than 1.45, you can steer the beam in at an angle greater than the critical angle and get this effect through an objective with no uh, really with just, and it just looks basically like an epifluorescence microscope, and it's a little bit tricky to align sometimes, but basically not that bad, really. So, so a very convenient way to get this effect. And the effect basically is that the, although all the light's reflecting off the interface, there's an evanescent wave that'll excite fluorescence to a depth of about 200 nanometers, and you can somewhat vary this depth by changing this angle. Uh, it's a kind of a complex waveform to figure out exactly how deep you're your imaging, but uh, certainly it's, it's, it's better, it, it greatly exceeds the axial resolution you'd get with a confocal microscope. The only rub is that you're excluded to these kinds of, uh, you know, sub, uh, uh, cover slip uh, aqueous interfaces, and anything within 200 nanometers of that you'll excite. So it's, it's super convenient for our supported bilayer system, not useful, not so useful for cell-cell interfaces and uh, other technologies we needed for that. Now, uh, we also use a, a method called interference reflection microscopy, which is similar to an epi-illumination experiment, but 
you basically take the ref capture the reflected light and the uh, basically uh, phase uh, shifts that basically happen as the light reflects off different types of uh, uh, interfaces between high, low, high refractive index basically give you destructive interference where cells get within uh, 100 nanometers or so uh, of the substrate, which is the exact distance that you'd have for cells adhering to the substrate. So we can get an image of the substrate. And then, uh, as Ellen just pointed out, like there's a lot of power in correlating these methods. So I'll also talk a little bit about correlating uh, total internal reflection total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy with electron tomography to get insight into the relationship between some of the fluorescence patterns we're seeing and the uh, ultrastructure. So, so just turf kind of transformed our understanding of things. So initially we had these, this impression from the wide field imaging and confocal imaging that we had this very structured interface that we defined as an immunological synapse where you had the ring of adhesion molecules in the central cluster of angin receptors Kind of a, it's very clear from work of other groups that this is also a secretory domain. So it was kind of a, you know, it was really, uh, you know, it's, it's complexity and organization rivaled in, uh, you know, secretory synapse in the nervous system. So that's why we kind of adopted that term. Uh, so, but TERF basically opened up our eyes to a lot of details within this structure that we couldn't pick up by confocal or fluorescence. And one of those was that the signaling process was driven by very small clusters of T-cell receptors that were formed in the periphery of this very dynamic interface. And then by the time these receptors reached the center, they'd essentially stopped signaling and uh, seemed to be just kind of parked in that central location, which was kind of surprising to us because initially we thought that central location would have been a focus of signaling. We could also see these uh, actin-rich uh, foci, uh, which go along with these microclusters, so that there was an actin polymerization process that seemed to be focused on these TCR microclusters, the actins in green and the T-cell receptors in red in this case. And it's, you can make out these kind of yellow, very distinctly yellow clusters. This was kind of a challenge because there's a lot of lamellipodial actin associated with the uh, periphery of the synapse where the signaling is happening and getting the contrast uh, with the actin probe uh, to basically distinguish that increase actin at these foci, at these TCR signaling sites from that background actin was very challenging, so TERF helped a lot with that. And of course, we can also do, uh, using electron multiplication CCD cameras, combined with TERF imaging, uh, single molecule uh, tracking experiments, where we can really get insight into this ultra-sensitive recognition process that T cells need to be able to use to, particularly to initiate immune responses, where you have very few of these MHC peptide complexes. So, but the thing I want to focus on is basically this relation, the kind of correlation between the total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy and the electron microscopy to understand what's happening in that central part of this immunological synapse, that central cluster of T cell receptors, which was, uh, you know, something that we had indications of that there was something interesting for some, for some time, but couldn't quite nail it down until we had the uh, combined kind of you know, identif molecular identification from the fluorescence combined with the ultrastructural resolution from the, uh, from the electron microscopy. So, so one thing we noticed in the, in the, as we were setting these systems up, kind of preliminary experiments in the 90s, we put uh, MHC peptide complexes in these supported lipid bilayers in a way that they were laterally immobile and just kind of used them as adhesion molecules, which is not very physiological, but, you know, it was, again, it was just, we were setting up the system and we just wanted to understand what the possibilities were with the T cell antigen receptor itself. And if you put enough MHC peptide complexes, the T cells will adhere, they'll form these contact areas, and the contact areas uh, actually have this kind of you know, uh, fine structure, which we, we didn't understand at that point. I mean, it's, there's some submicron structure that we're, you know, just able to access with the, uh, this, this uh, wide field illumination. A lot of the T cell receptors are focused in this interface, which is why we're not having a big problem with out-of-focus fluorescence in this case, because all the T cell receptors in the interface. Now, we, when we just knock the cells off with flow, what we noticed the T cell receptor got left behind in the substrate, and this seemed to happen quite easily. The cell basically was, was quite easy to dislodge at a, you know, maybe kind of after 20, 30 minutes on the substrate, they would just kind of almost like fall off on their own and leave these T cell receptors behind on the substrate. So, so it seemed like, so we kind of had this model that the T cell would leave uh, these receptors with the antigen presenting cell and that that, you know, I guess one, at that point, we were kind of primitive in our thinking, you know, maybe this thing would come under, you know, would, would 
provide some kind of persistent signal for the APC. So, so at that point, uh, but, but we, we didn't have much more insight into that until, until we did the EM. Now this is just kind of a, a movie of, what, of this immunological synapse formation forming that bullseye pattern. Again, excuse the compression artifacts. I just downloaded this from the website and I guess it was an early effort at compressing movies to go on a web. But the bottom line is that you, know, you go through this process of forming this bullseye-like structure, and this is what we would refer to as a stable synapse. So this is about, I think, 60 minutes total of evolution of this thing at you know, very uh, low, kind of 20x kind of resolution, and, and kind of just it really does an experiment designed to be able to take images over this long period of time rather than a particularly high resolution. But another thing we noticed is that in these systems, let's get this one to play, uh, is that in some cases, again, we had these uh, synapses would form on these now on these laterally mobile systems with the bilayer, where we're looking at the movement of these molecules into these patterns. This one kind of starts to form this symmetric structure that would be stationary, but then it actually breaks symmetry, moves off, and uh, again, leaves these uh, receptors, a patch of the receptors behind, and kind of drags some with it. So, so there was this, th again, tendency of the T cells, even on a perfectly mobile planar bilayer where it could probably drag them anywhere it wanted, it, it dumps a whole bunch of the T cell receptor on the substrate. So another, another aspect of the CSMAC that was kind of puzzling, and uh, you know, early on people did call us on this and we were kind of trying to figure out exactly what it meant, is that if you increase the amount of the MHC peptide complex in the substrate, you increase the intensity of this central cluster in a linear fashion. But if you look at the signaling process that's going on through those microclusters, it's saturated at a very low density of uh, a T cell receptors. So again, this, uh, you know, the T cell signaling response is very switch-like, whereas the, uh, you know, the, this process of building this central cluster of T cell receptors is, uh, is linear. And again, as I mentioned, like, say, T cell, B, T cell help for B cells would benefit from a linear relationship between MHC peptide complexes and feedback because that is the kind of information that B cells need. They need to know how many MHC peptide complexes they made and get proportional feedback from T cells. So, so, this, is, so this was an intriguing behavior, but again, we still didn't understand what it meant structurally. Uh, so another clue on the way to understanding this was to look at some different uh, polymer systems. And the formation of that synapse, that centralization of the T cell receptor, is dependent upon the actin cytoskeleton, kind of a centripetal actin flow. So that's one cytoplasmic polymer system that's very important in an active way, ATP-dependent way, for driving this interface. Uh, but there are, other, there are other cytoplasmic polymer systems that basically do some different things. And it was known since the mid-1980s that when you engage the T cell receptor, it'll undergo a so-called downregulation. It gets internalized, it goes into the cell, it uh, fuses the lysosomes and becomes degraded. That's, that's mainly the, what was mainly thought about the fate of the T cell receptor after signaling. Uh, but we, we knew uh, from some of our work in the uh, synapse with Andre Shaw, starting with a protein called CD2 associated protein that was an adapter for some ubiquitin ligases, that you could also see CSMAC phenotypes associated with changes in say whether or not CD2AP was present, uh, that would basically change the morphology of the CSMAC. Uh, the CD2AP phenotype was somewhat weak and variable in different genetic backgrounds in mice, so we started, we, we started to look at something that was more fundamental to the processing of ubiquitinated transmembrane proteins after signaling and prior to downregulation processes. And one of these is this uh, escort machinery, and uh, TSG 101 has already been mentioned in the context of retroviral budding, uh, is a molecule that basically recognizes ubiquitin in the cytoplasmic face of the plasma membrane, or of, you know, particularly, usually in endosomes. Uh, certainly in, re in retroviral budding, it does so, in, in at least HIV budding, it does so at the plasma membrane. So in T cells, it can happen. Usually it's in endosomal membranes. Uh, recognizes ubiquitin and initiates a kind of a polymerization reaction uh, with a, a monomers of a of the escort three component that generate uh, kind of punch, uh, generate buds effectively uh, in uh, intraluminal vesicles and endosomes and uh, you know, buds from the plasma membrane or also sometimes referred to as ectosomes. So what we saw with basically the TSG 101 knockdown is that the CSMAC didn't form properly and that there was a defect in signal termination, which has also been seen with other types of uh, tyrosine kinase-based receptors. This is basically a phosphate tyrosine signal. It's very exaggerated compared to the control siRNA. This is the normal level of phosphate tyrosine associated with T cell receptor signaling. This is perfectly good. This is basically just hypermorphic signaling that you see when you knock down TSG 101. So again, so somehow this cytoplasmic polymer system 
is involved in sorting receptors, we believe, in the plasma membrane in this context, and that was somewhat surprising. So just, this is just, again, a little bit of a review of the escorts. So you have, uh, you know, TSG-101 is here. It's considered escort one, recognized as ubiquitin. Uh, HRS would be an earlier ubiquitin recognizing step that's associated with, associated with clathrin needed in particularly. So the T cell receptor processing isn't clathrin dependent, so maybe it made sense that TSG-101 was the first molecule. Like HRS doesn't have, not them, doesn't have a phenotype. And then uh, we also looked at VPS4, which is a molecule that's involved in after these polymers basically form this uh, bud and create a bud neck, VPS4 is required to resolve that. So we heard about dynamin earlier for clathrin. So VPS4 is kind of like an ATPase that some sort of serves a similar function. It's not really like quite as much of a motor protein, but it, it's basically involved in resolution of the uh, bud neck in the uh, escort system. And I'll, and I'll have a schematic in a moment that'll make that a little clearer. So, uh, so Rajat Varma was, was doing these uh, turf elimination experiments, and these are just a couple of movies that illustrate the uh, phenomena of these T cell receptor positive particles that we would sometimes see released from the uh, T cells that seem to kind of diffuse out of the out of the central cluster, and again suggested that these uh, these large aggregates, which we couldn't really resolve in any way, uh, might be composed of smaller elements that would basically, in some situations, get loose and start moving around on the substrate. And these are, this is a T cell receptor label, so as your T cell receptor positive. And this is TERP, so they're, they're really trapped in this two-dimensional interface. They're, they're still interacting with the MHC molecules in the bilayer, uh, yet, and, and showing this diffusive behavior because they're no longer associated with the cell. So to get insight into this, we used, uh, we, we developed a method with uh, David Stokes at uh, New York University and uh, uh, Lance Cam at uh, Columbia to uh, generate a, a grid on which we could, and this is a nanofabricated chrome grid on the substrates that we could basically use to form, to, to visualize the uh, immunological synapses by fluorescence, and then uh, basically the chrome grid would leave an impression in the uh, plastic blocks that were used for the electron microscopy embedding for the topography, and we could get essentially uh, fluorescence images and uh, we could do on FOSS or, uh, uh, at least for the correlations, on FOSS uh, uh, tomograms or thin section EM of these uh, uh, interfaces. And it was very, you know, obviously technically demanding to get these sections. I think Ellen probably uh, presumably had similar challenges with, you know, getting these uh, particular sections at the electron microscopy level just requires a very skilled, careful technician not to lose the right section. Uh, but once you achieve this, basically, you can basically line up your F-actin, which is basically the uh, active part of the synapse, and the central TCR-enriched region. And what we could see basically is that there were, there were many vesicles here. And out of the, without knowing where the plasma membrane is, seeing vesicles in a synapse would not be surprising. But it turns out these vesicles are extracellular, and they're sitting on the other side of the plasma membrane. So this is a model that uh, Koshik generated, Koshik Shiduri, who's the postdoc in my lab who led the project, who uh, basically generated this model from uh, 400 nanometer uh, tomograms uh, showing the planar, the planar membrane here, the supported lipid bilayer, the uh, vesicles, which you were seeing, which were T cell receptor positive, and then the plasma membrane, which actually is deflected away from the interface. This is kind of an actin-based protrusion that's kind of folded over in the, kind of in the, within that compartment. Uh, but, but generally speaking, the plasma membrane is very close or just kind of lies very close to these uh, vesicles in the extracellular space. And then you have a number of other organelles that are associated with the polarization of the T cell in the uh, synapse. And basically, Kashyyyk uh, lovingly uh, traced these because uh, he's very interested in just kind of the cell biology. But uh, they're not critical for thinking about these, uh, at least, we, well, they probably are in some ways because there, there may be some issues of the delivering certain molecules to the plasma membrane, uh, which probably has to be done through a secretory process. But then once you've done that, we think you can bud these vesicles uh, in the interface, and the gold vesicles here are the fully released vesicles that are collected in one, uh, at least a good part of one of these uh, central uh, clusters. So as I mentioned before, T cells sometimes break symmetry and leave these vesicles behind. They then leave these patches, and this is what we saw back in 1999, but basically didn't at that point, understand that these are actually uh, single vesicles. Uh, and, and sometimes they have some cohesion, so we're trying to understand that. But they'll, they'll remain together, even if they're just diffusing, they'll remain together in these little patches for some time. And we can then uh, put in B cells that have 
particular MHC peptide complex is generated on their surface that it can be recognized by these T cells. So, and this is effectively a model antigen presenting cell having a tug of war with a real antigen presenting cell over one of these vesicles. And the T cells will basically engage these vesicles when they hit these patches, and they flux and have an increase in calcium in an antigen specific fashion. The MCC is the short name for the peptide that we're using uh, in the MHC molecule. So we provide that, uh, that peptide to the B cell, and then the B cell has the capability of grabbing those clusters, and when it does so, it signals. Uh, so in, in live B cell, T cell interfaces, what you see is a transfer of uh, vesicles from one cell to another, and we can see this through T cell immunofluorescence. When the vesicles move away from the synapse, we can detect them in the B cells, and we, by electron microscopy, you can see evidence of these double wall vesicles with T cell cytoplasm on the inside, and then extracellular media around them, and then a plasma membrane, and then another bit of endosomal membrane from the B cell. Uh, so we think these vesicles are transferred from T cell to B cell very efficiently, and we can also detect this in bulk by flow cytometry. This is just using a human system with uh, super antigens as a surrogate, and we see this transfer. So to think about this, basically you have uh, what we think is a cluster of T cell receptors interacting with the MHC peptide complexes in the T cell plasma membrane and the APC, this interface, and the, T cell, the system can't resolve these. They can't disengage them. They're basically too stable. So it has two choices. It can either generate a bud, uh, which would use the escort machinery to project this bud towards the antigen presenting cell, which then seems to uh, take it up very efficiently. Uh, or uh, it can basically use what a process referred to in some situations as transendocytosis, where it uses a clathrin-dependent or independent mechanism. And I've just illustrated clathrin here just for, for you know, as an example, but not, not committing to that fully. But probably a dynamin resolved uh, endocytic uh, vesicle that would basically capture a bit of the APC plasma membrane and pinch it off. And this is certainly observed in, in, in different contexts, sometimes more, maybe more generally referred to as trigocytosis, although certainly not always uh, clathrin dependent. So, so you have these kind of choices, and we think basically both of these things are happening. And uh, in, in the context of uh, T cell help for B cells, what we're thinking is these, this vesicle transfer may convey information uh, from the T cell to the B cell in kind of a packet form that then the B cell can even perhaps use as a uh, counter to determine the number of divisions it will undergo uh, in the process of uh, diversifying uh, its antibody repertoire. So say, for example, B cells go into the, from the light zone or neural zone to the dark zone after receiving T cell help, and in the dark zone they undergo a number of divisions where they also activate an enzyme that induces uh, mutation of their immunoglobulins, and that's, that's, the way, that's basically the way that you uh, set up the next round of selection with the T cells to determine, okay, which B cells have improved their receptors. Those, those B cells would get more MHC peptide complexes. Now, one of the key signals for that process is a molecule called CD40 ligand, and uh, what we've seen is that this uh, major T cell derived signal for B cells is also in these uh, ectosomes and would be uh, co transferred with the T cell receptor. So we think that this in and of itself would make this uh, transfer process, you know, basically, in, in fact, kind of give it the properties that we just described. But of course, this needs to be studied in more detail. And it's possible that this is due to the nature of this CD40 ligand molecule, that this may be. The, 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 you know, the, the, to basically be packaged into this type of a compartment, presumably through ubiquitination, may be the main way that this protein actually works physiologically. And we hadn't appreciated that before. So these uh, synaptic ectosomes are generated uh, in the immunological synapse, and it's an endogenous process that bears a lot of relationship to HIV budding. And actually, we've learned a lot from what people know about HIV budding. A lot of it seems to apply to these uh, vesicles that are generated with the endogenous T-cell receptor as a trigger. Uh, TSG101 and BPS4 are two of the components. So we have kind of, we bookended the escort pathway. We've done some analysis with other escorts, and that's, that's quite interesting, uh, but, but basically needs more work at this point. And we think that these synaptic ectosomes will transfer information to B cells that may stay with the B cell longer than the T cell can. So the T cell needs to interact with the B cell and then move on, but it can leave these vesicles with signals like CD40 ligand and the T cell receptor behind. And I'd like to uh, then acknowledge, uh, so again, I think this is an example of the kind of the power of using correlative methods or co combination methods, kind of like combination therapies for solving our immunological or uh, biological problems uh, that, that can be quite powerful, uh, power, more powerful than any single method. And I think we still, we'd love to be able to come up with a super resolution fluorescent method to look at these, but it's been a challenge because uh, 
you know, there's no molecule that we have that actually would uniformly surround these vesicles. And it actually is an incredibly crowded space. So even conventional super resolution would be kind of strained to resolve these structures in that, in that uh, CSMAT compartment. So, uh, so Koshik Shiduri, who's uh, currently starting his lab at the University of Michigan, uh, led the project in my lab with uh, David Stokes and Jaime Lodra, a student in, in David's lab, and uh, a lot of help from Joan Tsai and the correlative light and electron microscopy to make these grids. Uh, some help on HIV work I didn't talk about with Katarina Hio, and uh, we got a lot of help from, on human T cell, antigens T cells from Kai Vukafening and Susanna Gordo and his group. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, so I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time, so thanks.